welcome again to Talk in Sunday Readings. My name is Ann Carter. I am here again with Pastor Richard Stadler and with Father Chuck Carter. We are discussing the lectionary readings that have been assigned to the fifth Sunday in Lent. Um, the Old Testament is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. The New Testament epistle is from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b to 14. We are also going to have two uh, um, Gospels this week because different churches choose different readings. And our reading from the book of John is from chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And also we're going to talk about a reading from the book of Luke, chapter 20, verses 9 through 20. Uh, we are getting closer and closer to pad the Passion of Christ. We're getting closer and closer, and the readings in uh, that we are going to talk about, I think, emphasize that Jesus knows, and we're getting closer to his death. A reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior, they lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me. The jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 43, we have, I think, the two key verses, verses 18 and 19. He tells us, do not remember the former things, because in verse 19, I'm about to do a new thing. And the new thing is going to be water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. Um, he is going to bring about new life in a way that has not been seen before. Uh, um, and in such, in such a way, all of creation is going to be different in the new day. Um, mm -hmm. You had some thoughts uh, this, on that, if I can turn it over. Yeah, this new day, uh, this new thing, uh, extends uh, in verse 20, um, that even the wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. And before we uh, started the session, we were speaking a little bit about um, purity laws in the Old Testament and how there are certain animals that God uh, regarded as clean and acceptable for sacrifice and other animals that were not. Um, and here, uh, certainly, certain wild animals would not be acceptable um, according to the uh, ritual purity laws of, of the Old Testament. But even here, uh, it says that um, the wild animals will give God honor. And so um, the, it's, it's opening up this bigger vision of God's relationship with, uh, with the whole With, with the whole, whole creation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. there's a wonderful underscoring of that God is the main actor. The God is the one who's going to make all this happen. Mm -hmm. And then there's a natural response on the part of his people who then respond um, in the last verse, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare oh, my, my praise. praise. And so mm -hmm. the goodness of God anticipates and expects a thankful mm -hmm. response from the people who receive it. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And so that, that's a wonderful connection. If any of us ask, what is the purpose of living? Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of life? It's to give him praise. Exactly. And when you praise him through song, through study, through word, through living, your whole life is more, mm -hmm. as he mm -hmm. expresses in this new creation. It's just exactly. more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, moving then, if no other comments, we'll move to Philippians 3. A reading from Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, 
blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, this is Paul, again writing, and he Paul talks about himself. He talks about his own accomplishments, his own pride, his own, yeah. his own standing, self-righteousness, self <laughs> his own right. standing before God, and he makes fun of it. Yeah. He says, none of this matters, but yeah. look at me, look at all I've done, look at everything I've done, mm -hmm. and psh, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's absolutely nothing. All the things that I have tried to do, all the things I've accomplished, it is nothing. I have come to regard it as a loss because of Christ, yeah. and because knowing that Christ, Jesus, is my Lord. And any righteousness that he could brag about, he refuses to brag about. And he says instead, the righteousness that I do have is not because of me, but because of Christ. And he has given me this righteousness through faith. Mm -hmm. And that's what he argues all through mm -hmm. his epistles. Yeah. Yeah. It is faith in Christ. Right. Faith in what he has done. Believe that he came back from the dead. Believe that God the Father instituted all of this. Believe that God the Father fulfilled his promises in the Old Testament, that it's all connected. And the thing I like mm -hmm. about this section is that you could easily accuse Christians of being do-nothings because all you're doing is trusting that Jesus has made you acceptable to God, therefore you don't have to do anything. But he says, no, there is a compulsion to do something, to strive to be as righteous as I can. Mm -hmm. And it isn't in order to get accepted by God. Mm -hmm. It's because I know I am accepted by God. And so it's mm -hmm. the motivational difference that is really the key here. And uh, so he's not advocating Christian passivity, mm -hmm. but he's advocating a Christian response of gratitude that opens your life up to the influence of the Holy Spirit so that mm -hmm. you are striving to improve and to grow and to do as much mm -hmm. as you can mm -hmm. uh, to be the kind of person God has called you to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you are an artist and you have been accepted into the school of a world famous artist, you have, you're there, mm -hmm. you're in his presence, therefore you learn from him, you become better right. at what it is that drives you. And, and you that's, strive to be like him. And you strive right? to be like, like him. Like your mentor. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and that's what the believer does, having received this wonderful, these wonderful gifts of grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The Holy Gospel according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. 
Moving then to John 12. Um, and I highlighted here again. We're getting closer to the Passion. It's six days before the Passover. Six days he's got left and he knows what's coming. And he's in Bethany. He's in Bethany with Mary and Martha and with Lazarus. And it's noted that he, that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Martha does what she does. She is a, she is a hostess. Consummate hostess. She's a consummate <laughs> hostess, and she makes sure that his needs are met. And Lazarus is at the table with Jesus, and here comes Mary. And she anoints his feet with pure nard. Now, there are a few sociological things we can say. Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus must have had some sort of wealth, mm -hmm. because you can't afford that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just too expensive. And she anointed them... She anointed Jesus' feet. She wiped his feet with her hair. The, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Jesus says about this sacrifice, she bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. Mary knew what was coming. Did she believe that this was happening and so she anointed Jesus with it? That's my first question. My second, is it strong enough that when Jesus was dying that he could smell that? perfume that he could smell it on his feet mm. or was it I meaning you wash your feet you wash your feet you wash your feet i don't know what nard mm -hmm. is if it gets into the the your skin cells mm -hmm. um i've often i have hoped that perhaps he did and that he remembered that she loved him uh, one possible answer to your first question is this is the same mary who in an earlier story was sitting at the feet of jesus mm -hmm when Martha was busy, 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 and angry at Mary for not helping her mm -hmm. take care of the serving of the guests. And Jesus says to her, Mary has found the one thing needful. Mm -hmm. And so if Mary was like Mary, the mother of Jesus, who listened attentively, pondered all these things, there's a very good chance that she had been paying attention to all of his sermons and all mm -hmm. of his teachings. And she anticipated that what he had been saying repeatedly on the way to Jerusalem, that I'm going to suffer and die, that I'm going to rise the third day. And so she acts on that. Mm -hmm. It's possible. It's I, possible. We uh, don't know. Can't prove it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's interesting is the identification of Judas as a thief. Mm -hmm. um, that this is the only one of the Gospels that I can find that says it bluntly. Mm -hmm. um, and that his posturing for using the money for the poor was just a, a fraudulent front, you know. And therefore, um, Jesus says, you always have the poor with you. I think sometimes that's been misused by some people to justify um, indolence on the part of the Christian church, saying, well, we've always got poor people, so we don't have to do anything for them. I don't think that's what Jesus is advocating here. I think what he's saying is that your excuse for what Mary is doing, Judas, is totally off base. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the point is, uh, this is serving a, another purpose, and a greater purpose, actually. And that doesn't mean that you don't also then help the poor, mm -hmm. but it means that you understand what is about to happen in the experience of Jesus. He's about to die. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what was the meaning of that which is written, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? 
Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately, because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. With no other comment, then, we'll move right into Luke. Um, the title that I got off of when I printed this and everything that I have learned is, the par is that it's the parable of the tenants. The emphasis always on those who... The, those who had occupied the, the, par the, the vineyard. As Ken Bailey has pointed out, it's actually the parable of the noble vineyard owner. Yeah. It is a parable about the owner of the vineyard and his response to these men who had taken over his property and how the owner of the vineyard had the right to call the authorities and say, go in and wipe these people out because they're occupying my land. Instead, he offers grace over and over and over again. First, he sends servants, and then he sends more servants. And finally, he says, I hope that they will honor my son. I'm gonna give him one last chance. And as, as Bailey translates, um, perhaps they will respect him. He translated, perhaps they will feel shame in his presence. Perhaps they will look at the sun and they will feel shame about what they're doing. And finally, exhibit integrity. Yes. He gives them a chance over a chance. and over and over again. And he sends his son, alone and unarmed, into the midst of this hostile environment. Yep. And then we know that Jesus is walking into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It's a power, it's it's a much more powerful story than I ever than I ever understood before. What is striking is that at the end of the story, Jesus says um, he will give the vineyard uh, to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so if the vineyard is the kingdom of God, the religious authorities shout back, absolutely not. <laughs> no, we are the guardians mm -hmm. of, the, of the community. Mm -hmm. And they understand that Jesus is talking about them mm -hmm. and that there's been generation after generation of prophets who have been mistreated by the people of God and by the religious leaders of Israel. And now his son is his last demonstration mm -hmm. of his graciousness and he's giving them a chance. Mm -hmm. And they blow it. Yeah. And it's interesting. He gives them the chance, and he says they're, they, they're going to kill the son. So what do they do? They go out and they plan to kill him. They, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, it, it, is this John? No, this is Luke. But in John's gospel, it says that after the resurrection of Lazarus, they also put a contract out on Lazarus. Yes. He's living proof mm -hmm. of what Jesus is claiming for himself. Mm -hmm. And so here you've got a, a similar kind of indictment on the religious leaders who mm -hmm. are just ignoring what's standing right in front of their face. Yeah. yeah. He, they send spies. They look for a way to arrest him. They, they send spies to watch on him, to pretend to mm -hmm. be sincere. They hope to catch in Jesus in something he said. And I also found interesting the final... In, uh, well, in our reading, is they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So mm -hmm. from the beginning, they wanted Pilate to kill him. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have their hands clean of the entire event, so they were trying to set up the evidence so that Pilate would have no excuse except to kill him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why the accusations that we will hear during Holy Week mm -hmm. are he has claimed to be a king you know, against mm -hmm. the emperor, and he's mm -hmm. also uh, forbidden taxes, mm -hmm. and they'll make up all kinds of political uh, attacks on, against him mm -hmm. to make him sound like a dangerous person to the empire. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, then Pontius Pilate could mm -hmm. declare him guilty. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, yeah, this it, is a powerful uh, parable. Yeah, it's a powerful parable. And when he says, um, he says he will come and give the vineyard to others. The, the kingdom of God then is a kingdom that is made up not only of Jews but also of Gentiles. And this is the moment when it's going to happen, mm -hmm. when we are all going to be included in this new thing. Right. It's what we've been talking about, this new creation that's going to happen. When the Jews and the Gentiles and men and women and rich and poor were all going to be together, 
offering praise to God. And, and what he's implying here is that the kingdom is not going to be given to the Gentiles in exclusion no. of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like you were saying, it's going to embrace the whole world, mm -hmm. Jews and Gentiles, mm -hmm. and give them a chance mm -hmm. to receive what God wants them to have by grace. We will all be reconciled yeah. in Christ. Yeah, there's a real connection with a lot of these readings mm -hmm. on this Sunday. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you once again for joining us. Um, and a thank you again to Tim Carter, who is our producer. Uh, we welcome any um, <clears throat> shares. We welcome any likes. And we hope that you will come back.